And he said, uh, I don't go to church, but he said, if I ever do go to church, there's only one church I would ever go to, that's Church of the Rock. Because they came down and they cleaned up my community. And then he said this, and he said, and I saw their pastor down on his hands and knees on the street picking up garbage. I'm thinking to myself, I must have been posing for a picture or something. <laughs> There's no way I would do that, right? No, we're not. Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. Today I'm doing a little message called Recalibrate. Now, you probably know more about me than you want to know, because I'm pretty self-disclosing and tell everything about everything. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you something about me that you don't know, and you're not going to want to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I am obsessed with what direction I am facing. And I go through life, and I always have to know what direction I'm in and facing. And I'm facing south, by the way, right now. And when I go into a building, I always look at the orientation of the door, what direction is the door facing, so then I will know when I'm in the building what direction I am facing in the building and what direction I'm going down a hallway. And when I drive my car, I always need to know what direction I'm going. When I go into another city, I hate it because I don't know the, the landmarks, and so I'm looking around at the sun, which way is south, which way is north. And I'm a little obsessive about it. You probably already figured that out. Maybe a little OCD, or as I like to call it, CDO, because it's more alphabetically correct. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it is kind of my thing about direction. And some of you will remember, I had this wonderful van that I drove for 17 years, the white minivan. It was a bit famous in the parking lot here. People always knew when I was around. Uh, I was the only one still left driving one of these things long after they stopped making them. Uh, it was the subject of many sermons and the butt of many people's jokes about why their pastor drove this car. And I'll tell you why I drove this vehicle. It was a very fancy vehicle with a lot of special features. It had an AM, FM radio. It had real cloth seats. It had features you just don't find on cars today. And one of the things that I particularly loved about it, no joke, was it had this overhead compass, digital compass, in the overhead console here. And it was bright, and it was digital, and it just gave me the letters N or E or, or NE for Northwest. And I always knew what direction I was, I was traveling, which, because of my little obsession, I always liked. Well, one day I'm driving along in my van, and I got my kids in the car, I'm taking them somewhere, and all of a sudden, a C appears on the digital compass. And I'm thinking, what direction is C? So I have to pull over because I don't know what direction I'm going, right? I said, hand me the manual. They said, why are we stopping? I said, I can't tell what direction I'm going. Hand me the manual. So they hand me the manual out of the glove box. I look it up, and I find out that C means that the compass is out of calibration and it needs to be recalibrated. And you know how you had to recalibrate it? Some of you had a car like this. You had to drive around in circles. <laughs> and so I drove into a parking lot and started driving around in circles. My kids say, why are we driving around in circles? And I said, I am recalibrating. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. How many of you have felt over the last couple of years you've lost your sense of direction? I mean, I think all of us, to some degree, have lost a little bit of our sense of direction and feel like we're driving around in circles. I mean, let's be honest about it. The rules of life change every single week. They tell us how you live and how you got to go, go through life, and what you got to do and what you can't do. And how do you plan? How do you plan to do anything? If you ever want to go on a trip, how do you plan to travel? What is it going to take to get on a plane? Where you're going to have to be vaccinated, double vaccinated, Triple vaccinated, what, what is it going to take to travel? I don't know. And I think we're all a little bit thrown off, all lost a little bit of sense of direction. But here's the thing. You actually can't really do anything about what goes on out there. All those things that are going on, all those things that are driving you crazy, there's actually not a single thing you can do about it. But you can recalibrate your heart. And if we will recalibrate our heart, everything will change. All right, so here's what I want to do. If we're going to recalibrate... I'm going to give you some uh, compass points today, and they're not north, east, west, south, but here they are. I'm going to throw them up on the screen. If we're going to recalibrate our heart, here's what they are. Number one, we need to rejoice in the Lord. Number two, reconnect your relationships. Number three, re-engage in the mission. And number four, we need to reimagine the future. 
So we're going to start with the first one, which is rejoice in the Lord, because let's face it, if there is a true north, the true north is the Lord. He is the one. If we can get our focus in life, everything else aside, if we can get our focus on him, then we will know uh, we will be on the right direction. We will be pointed in the right direction. So we start there. That is, is true north. And what I'm going to be doing through this message today is I'm going to be drawing on the story of Nehemiah taking the children of Israel back into Jerusalem. And you will remember, here's why it's relevant to us today. They were in lockdown for 70 years. You think you had a bet. They were in lockdown for 70 years. When they finally got back to the city of Jerusalem, everything they had built for centuries was destroyed. Their city was destroyed. Their wall was destroyed. Their temple was destroyed. Their culture was destroyed. Their homes were destroyed. Their, even their, their, their lifestyle and their type of worship, everything was gone. And they had to start in this place. And they were excited at first. And they got really, really discouraged. And then Ezra, who was the high priest, you'll remember this, Nehemiah chapter 8, he stood up and he said to them, do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You all know that. And he said, look, you're looking at this, you're getting bogged down by all of these externals. You need to understand this, that the joy of the Lord is your strength, and if you will focus on him, and if you will rejoice in the midst of this, he will see you through it. Now, I want to show you a passage, this is my text for today, that uh, Peter gave us that is even more specific about this. It's really extraordinary. It's been really speaking to me over the last uh, couple of weeks. And it's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. This is what it says. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice. Did you hear that? What his advice is, but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly great joy. Now, I wonder if you notice what he said. He said, don't think this is some sort of strange thing that you're facing, this hardship, this trial. He's writing to people that were going through some persecution. He says, don't think it's some strange thing. Don't think that you're so, something special, that you're so special, that this is unique to you, and no one has ever str struggled and had a hard time in life. He says, this is part of life. And you know, I know what we've been thinking. We have been wondering, why is this strange thing happened to us? Why am I living in the 21st century when I'm in the middle of a global pandemic? What did I do wrong to deserve this? And we act like something bad has never happened in the earth before. Do you know that every single generation has faced cataclysmic events that have irrevocably changed their culture forever? Every generation. All you have to do is look at the last century, the 20th century, and let's talk about the few things that happened in the 20th century alone. There was a Great Depression. There was two world wars. There was countless civil wars. There was dictators and despots that rose up. There was civil wars everywhere. There was genocides everywhere. And there was a global pandemic, the Spanish flu, that killed 10 times as many people as COVID-19. In a way, we don't have anything to complain about. And all he's saying is this. He is saying, don't think it's strange what you're going through. You live in a broken and fallen world. You've got to expect life to look a little bit like this. And then he tells us what the remedy is, the same remedy that Nehemiah gave them, because Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he is saying exactly the same thing. And he says, if you want to know what to do and where to head in life, all you have to do is rejoice. And what I want to do is I want to take a minute today and I want to talk about the difference between being happy and rejoicing. Because in Scripture, they're very, very distinct. It's, being happy is, is still important. The Scripture talks to you about being happy 30 times. It says be happy. So we all want to be happy. How many want to be happy? Who doesn't want to be happy? Everyone wants to be happy. Happy is good. Uh, but 300 times, the Scripture tells us to rejoice. So rejoice on some level has got to be more important than being happy. Now, here's the significant difference. Here's what happiness is. Happiness is based on externals. You all know this, is that what happens, if, if something good happens to you, you are happy. If something bad happens to you, you're sad. You're sad. Something bad happens, you're sad. 
And so what happens is people go on this roller coaster in life. Every time something good happens, they're happy. Every time something bad happens, they're sad. And they're going through this emotional roller coaster like this. And so during the pandemic, people had to order something from Amazon every single day <laughs> so that that package would arrive so that they could be happy and they could have this endorphin hit, right? When the package arrives and you open it up, only to discover it's broken, you gotta send it back, <laughs> right? My neighbor, <laughs> the, the FedEx truck came to our neighbor's house every single day. I thought, what's he gonna do with all that junk? Where is he gonna store it? What is he, is he building a bomb over there? What's going on over there with him? And you know what? People just had to do something to keep themselves happy. And the problem is that it's all based on externals. The difference between happiness and joy is that joy has to do with what's on the inside. See, joy is a choice and has nothing to do with externals. And you can find joy in the midst of adversity and trial. And that's what the scripture is telling us to do. And in fact, it is the secret to success in the midst of trials. Do you remember what James said? James said, count it all joy when? When you fall into various trials. What was, he, what, what was he thinking? Is that when you get happy? No, you're not happy. What you do is you count it all joy. You decide you're going to rejoice in the midst of adversity, in the midst of trial, and everything will change. I remember one time, I will never forget this story, and some of you will, were here, so you'll remember but I was preaching on that passage out of James where he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And then I asked this question, I says, who really does that? Do any of us really do that? Is that what we do? We count it all joy when we fall into various trials? Do we lose our job and go, woohoo, I lost my job. Maybe I'll lose my house as well. And then, or do we say, I broke my leg. Woohoo, maybe I'll break my other leg as well. And just as I said this, honest to God truth, it was a Saturday night service. Just as I said, maybe I'll break my other leg as well, a guy came through that back door in a wheelchair with casts on both legs. <laughs> two, count them, two broken legs. And he's wheeling in with these broken legs sticking straight up front. And I said, I said this, I said, I broke my leg. Woohoo, maybe I'll break my other leg. And just then he says, woohoo, that's what happened to me. I broke both my legs. <laughs> Everybody in the room thought I'd set this up. <laughs> Seems like a setup, right? Seems like a total setup. The whole pastor remarked, he's so funny. He had this guy fake two broken legs. I didn't know what was going on. I thought, why is a guy rolling in with two broken legs in the middle of this story about having broken legs? So he comes up the aisle. Everybody's laughing because they think it's a big gag. And I'm dumbfounded. And I go, what? You broke your... And I stopped and started talking to him. I said, you got two broken legs? He said, I got two broken legs. I said, what happened? He said, I was the victim of a home invasion. This guy came into my apartment with a gun and I was running for my life and I jumped off of my balcony and I broke both my legs. And I thought, you're kidding me. Everybody's still laughing. They still think the thing's made up. This poor guy's got two broken legs. And I said, okay, so why are you so excited? You have two broken legs. Is he said, because the alternative was he was going to kill me. <laughs> so I got two broken legs. Woohoo! <laughs> and I thought, man, you can't pay money for this. <laughs> you can't make stuff like this up. Well, I could make stuff like that up. Uh, but you get my point. And so here's what I'm trying to drive at here today, is that we need to learn, coming out of this thing that we've gone through the last couple of years, is that we need to learn how to rejoice. That is the secret. That is the secret to success, is to rejoice in the midst of the season. And if anybody's got anything to rejoice about, it's us. Wouldn't you agree to that? Amen. All right, so the first thing is this. The true north is to, to rejoice in the Lord. The second thing is this, is to reconnect with our relationships. And see, one of the things, if you're a history buff, and you'll know this, that one of the great uh, military strategies of history has always been to divide and conquer. You heard that expression. Everybody used it. Napoleon used it. Uh, Julius Caesar used it. Genghis Khan used it. They all used it. And if they could divide their enemies or they could not unify, then you can conquer them. In fact, you can rule them. It was exactly the strategy that Nebuchadnezzar used when he came in and sacked Jerusalem 70 years before Nehemiah. And he came in and he spread them all over and sent some to Babylon, different places. And he knew if he could keep them separate and prevent them from actually unifying, that he could hold them at bay. 
By the way, Nebuchadnezzar did not invent this strategy. Satan did. Satan has been dividing people since the beginning of time because if he knows he can divide us, he can keep us down. And let me tell you something. COVID really threw us off our game because we're all about relationship. We're all about people. We don't actually produce a physical product, do we, the church? What do we produce? We produce people or working with people, and that's all we do. And what happened during COVID, we couldn't gather together. We couldn't visit one another. We couldn't pray with one another. We couldn't do our ministries to one another. We couldn't reach out to other people. And it was so profoundly difficult for us as the church because we've always been about people. We've always been about connecting on a relational level. And all of a sudden, it was gone. So here's what Nehemiah says about this. Because the enemy had come again even as they had come back into Jerusalem and they were about to rebuild or had started to rebuild. And then the enemy started to divide them and push them apart and try to physically distance them. And so this is what Nehemiah says. It's Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. He says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. Fight for your brethren, for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You see, what he tells us to do is that you actually have to fight for your relationships, particularly with what we've gone through. And we understood the good intentions of lockdown. We, we got it. But the effects that it had on us were profound, especially the church. And there was a lot of talk in the media about the potential mental and, and emotional health effects, but nobody ever quantified it, right? We just sort of heard this in sort of vague terms. Until now, there was a study released recently about the very first wave that happened in Italy. You all remember what happened in Italy. And all those people in northern Italy, they were dropping like flies. They went into the very first major lockdown of these people. Many of them were elderly. And they actually decided to study them. There was 1,006 people, mostly elderly. And they wanted to see if there was any sort of psychological, emotional, or mental effects uh, from this lockdown. And the results are pretty profound. They said there was significant cognitive and emotional impairment as a result. And they found that even parts of the brain began to shrink. And you know, the point is, we were never meant to live like that. We can't actually live like that. And we know that because we've all seen the movie Cast Away with Tom Hanks, right? I mean, you remember this movie, right? Where he was alone on this deserted island for months and months and months. And he kind of lost his marbles, didn't he? And he made friends with a volleyball. His best friend was the volleyball, Wilson. And you will remember, the saddest part in the movie for me was this, when Wilson floated away in, in the sea, and of course, we didn't know what happened to him. And poor, poor Tom, right? Wilson, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Wilson. He was apologizing to a volleyball. But you, you look at it, you go, he really lost his mind. Why? Because man was never created to live alone. And the story of Castaway was actually loosely based on some research done by a French uh, researcher, scientist, by the name of Michael Siffre. And what he did, he, want, he used himself as the subject, and he locked himself into a cave by himself for six months. Here's a picture of him. And he hooked up electrodes to his brain. He journaled everything. And he wanted to see what kind of effects his isolation would have on him emotionally and physically. He wrote, after two months, he wrote that he could barely string two thoughts together. By five months in, he was so destitute and so desperate, he tried to befriend a mouse who would not reciprocate and be his friend. The mouse's name was Mickey. <laughs> I'm making that part up. Hi, hi, Mickey. What's your name? You gotta love Mickey Mouse's voice, eh? I'm just imagining befriending a mouse. And the the whole point of this was we were never made to live like that. We were never created to live like that. The scripture says the very first problem, think about this for a moment. What was the very first problem that we find in scripture? Before sin, before the, the, the fall in the garden, before the serpent. Anybody remember? Genesis chapter two, some of you got it. It's, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. We weren't created to be alone. That's not who we are. We were created to be a part of a community. And that's why we, we can't even survive without a community. We have Nehemiah saying here, crying out here, he says, fight for your family. 
Fight for your, your brothers and your sisters and your brethren and your houses. He's saying fight for your friends. Fight for the people that are around you because you need one another. You were created for that kind of relationship. And here's what I think. I think that coming out of the pandemic as we are, I think people are going to long for genuine relationship. I'm convinced of it. And you know what? They're not going to find it on social media. That is not the right venue for it. There is a place for social media. I don't think it's a necessarily a bad thing. But it is not going to give you genuine relationship. I have a friend who likes to brag about having 3,000 friends on Facebook. You know what I always say to him? Name them. <laughs> he can't name them. He doesn't know who they all are. Good try. Uh, you know, those are whatevers, but they're not genuine relationships. They're not friends. We are relational creatures, and we need one another. We need our family. We need our friends, and we need our relationships. And we need to reconnect with those relationships. And the world is going to be looking to the church because nobody does it better than we do. But let me give you one little small caveat. Yeah, somebody wants to cheer. You go ahead. Let me give you one little small caveat on this, because if the lockdown and isolation wasn't bad enough, there was something else that started happening, and we started fighting with one another. Yeah. Nehemiah said to fight for one another, not with one another. And I don't know if in my lifetime I have ever seen the kind of division that we are seeing right now, where people are fighting over everything. Have you noticed? Have we lost our minds? Answer, yes. Yes, we kind of have. And I'll tell you why. You know what's going to happen in six months or a year? You know all these things we've been fighting about? Everybody's going to forget about them. Nobody's going to remember this. Do you think anybody's going to be talking about masks in a year from now? You know how well th the things that divided families and divided churches and divided all these masks fights that people had? And in a year from now, people are going to go, <laughs> remember that time we used to wear masks? Yeah, that was weird. That, that'll be it because there's nothing to fight about. And so what we have to do is we have to fight for our relationships, not against them. That's what the scripture tells us to do. So, so the first thing is this, you rejoice in the Lord. The second thing is this, is that you reconnect with your, with your relationships. The third thing is that you re-engage in the mission. And one of the great things uh, about what happened to Nehemiah's bunch is they got off mission. They got discouraged. There was opposition. There was rubble. And he says, remember your Lord, great and awesome. And when he reminded them of what they had done in the past, it says every man returned to his work. And when I look at our church and what we've done, there's a lot of things that really excite me. I mean, we did a lot of fun things together. And uh, sometimes you look at what happened during COVID and you remember the good old days and probably some of you remember those Easter presentations we put with cartoon characters and superheroes on stage, people lining up outside to get into the building. Some of you remember times when the building was so packed it was standing room only. And we did all these kinds of things that were definitely highlights. But the real true highlights were actually the things we did on mission together. When we got out of the four walls of the building and we began to put our arms together and we went into battle together, those were the times that I remember most dearly. And I, I could give you lots and lots of examples, but I'll give you one of them. When I think about Love Winnipeg, when the churches in the city participated, when we as, as the church, we came up with dozens and sometimes hundreds of different initiatives to reach our city. And I'll remember, and some of you remember this, how many remember the Red Sea Rally? It was during the season where our Love Winnipeg shirts were red. They were white. They were red. They were yellow. It's the red season. And there was some 62 churches gathered on the steps of the legislative buildings. 300 of you showed up. And then what we did was we fanned out in every direction out from the legislative buildings. And Church of the Rock chose the Osborne Village. And so we walked down Osborne and into the village. And we started just cleaning up the street. We collected bags and bags of garbage, and we were just cleaning up the street and sweeping up the street and picking up garbage. We had sharps containers, and we were picking up hypodermic needles from the back lanes and other gross things that I won't even mention. And we were do doing these things. We were handing out water bottles. We were sharing the love of Christ with people. And then a bunch of us went down under the Osborne Street Bridge that goes over Cinnaborne right here. We were on our way. And when we got down there, there was people living down there, squeegee kids living under that bridge in just absolute filth and squalor. And we cleaned up all their garbage. We didn't take their mattresses and their blankets, but we cleaned up all their garbage for them. And we just did it because that's what you do, right? And I remember thinking, what a great day that was. 
And then a week later, I got an email from a friend of mine. And he said, you know, you know my son, he had gone astray, and he's actually now living down in the village. And he said he encountered you guys last week when you were down in the village. And he said, uh, I don't go to church, but he said, if I ever do go to church, there's only one church I would ever go to, that's Church of the Rock. Because they came down and they cleaned up my community. And then he said this, and he said, and I saw their pastor down on his hands and knees on the street picking up garbage. I'm thinking to myself, I must have been posing for a picture or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way I would do that, right? No, no. And I thought, you know what? That is so exciting to me. Because what we did is we touched a community, and that's the mission. And we did it together. And when I look at this church, see, what is the success of this church? I mean, why has it been as successful as it's been? You know what? It's because of each and every one of you. The fact that we've had not hundreds, but thousands of volunteers that have joined arm in arm. We've gone out and we've done everything we've done together. And you know what? We need to re-engage in the mission. And the reason people love this church is because of the mission. The fact that every week people get saved in this church. The fact that every year we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for overseas mission and the gospel go goes out around the world. The fact that we do medical clinics and we feed the poor and we do all these things and you get to be part of it. But we are concerned about advancing the kingdom in our world. That is why people are so passionate about this church. So the first compass point is this, rejoice in the Lord. Number two, to reconnect with our relationships. Number three, re-engage in the mission. And number four, to reimagine the future. You know, in Netflix got a new CEO in 2013. His name was Reed Hastings. And he looked at what they were doing. He asked this question. They said, are we in the digital streaming business or are we in the digital entertainment business? Because if we're in the streaming business, we're never going to be able to compete with Comcast and, and Google and Apple and these things that have this huge, huge network. We're not going to be able to do that. But he says, you know, maybe what we should think about is reinventing ourselves and actually producing original content that would win Emmys and Oscars. How many of you know who's been winning all the Emmys and Oscars in the last few years? It's actually been Netflix. And they did this shift from just streaming other people's content to streaming their own content, producing their own content, started winning all the awards. They had a ton of money to begin with. But do you know that since that time, since 2013, their revenues have increased three times and their profits have in increased 32 times? It was a huge success. And it was such a small little pivot. What is the future going to look like? Because I think the future of the church is going to look a little bit different than in the past because I think everything has changed. When we look at the world, science, technology, medicine, are they solving the world's problems? <laughs> you, I don't think so. And I don't think them, they're solving people's problems. And I think people who have hope exclusively in technology and science are sadly disappointed. And we have something that supersedes and transcends anything the world can and will do, and it's called the supernatural. He has given us the gifts of the Spirit. He has given us the power of God. Jesus said, even in his own time, he said, you people won't believe unless you see signs and wonders. And so then he turned to the church and he said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, you shall do these things and you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And then you get into the book of Acts and what does it say? It says many signs and wonders were done at the hands of the apostle and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think the world is going to be hungry for the supernatural in the days ahead. Not the weird zombie vampire stuff they're already watching on television. I'm talking about the real supernatural where the God of heaven brings his resources down to earth and transforms people's lives because we were broken and sinful people living in a broken and a sinful world and God wants to show up and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea and I believe our greatest days are yet ahead because he says the glory of the uh, latter house will be greater than the former. Our greatest days are right ahead. <laughs> Amen. If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.